Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this 200 Russian cash live sweat on GG Poker with the one and only Hugh, who is back by popular demand. I mentor Hugh in this session as he sits in and sits out of the 200 Russian cash pool, going over some of the hands he's played, including an absolutely wild 4-bet pot towards the end of the video with ace-queen suited. We have a few cool spots to get to before that, though. Hope you like it, and if you do enjoy this format, leave us a like. Leave us a comment and we can for sure make more of these with different regs and students and content creators. Enjoy the video. All right, guys, I think this is a, a format of session you're really going to like. I'm here with Hugh, who is no stranger to the channel by now. And Hugh, you are going to grind some 200 rush and cash one table. We're going to sit in, sit out. We're going to get the editor to put the hand up on the screen after we're finished playing it and we're going to discuss it. And this is going to be a mentoring slash me sort of advising you session. I know you've had a bit of a rough morning poker wise. Tell people the reality of what it is to be a grinder. What have you experienced today and how typical is that for the average poker player? Yeah, uh, today I was playing a couple hours and I'm down around 10 buy-ins, running a little bit below EV, which is, you know, unfortunately the reality of the game. Like sometimes... Uh, you go left and they've gone right. You go down, they go up. Just no matter what you do, it's always the wrong thing. But unfortunately, especially when you have such a low sample size in one day, that's just the reality of the game is that it can suck. The game sucks a lot of times. Uh, but, you know, the best thing you can do is get some mentoring, you know, review the hands and uh, try focus, clean up the mistakes because I'm sure there's probably some stuff that I've done which has led to me losing even bigger pots than I should have and, um, you know, winning less than I should have in the pots that I do have the winning hand. So, you know, hopefully you help me out today. Yeah, so today's just going to be about being really objective, just being really curious, just when we when we are in one of those funks where we've been losing, there's kind of like a, a devil and like the road to hell and there's then the angel on your shoulder and, and the sort of pearly gates, right? And it's like a fork in the road. And the demons there are definitely like the, we need to get even, we need to gamble more than usual, we need to like try and get the resources back. I was coaching a guy the other day and I sort of said, describe to me this tilt you're talking about. And he, he just kind of came out with, I need to make money. And I was like, that's such an important thought. I need to make money. And that fear of not making money or being down resources. And it comes back to our evolutionary roots and not being able to eat and all sorts of things. And it's about, can we channel enough curiosity about that technical side of the game that we just choose the right road? We choose the bright path and not the dark one. And so let's just remain as curious and as geeked out as we possibly can today and like try and sort of worship Get that monument lines. of strategy yeah rather than the results it's, it's, it's the fork in the that's road it. let's take the right path all right let's sit and let's play some some cards here okay so we got a limp from the small blind i'm just gonna check it over here it's gonna check to me with jack nine um probably could implement usually the only bed sides that i have for this are like probably 3x so like 150 or like a 1.5 so 75 percent gonna go for over bet this time just because why not king of clubs on the turn and he checks it over so we still have the gut shot which is obviously nice uh block nine eight jack eight i think i'm gonna go for a, about a six big line so another like 75 66 percent or 75 in this case Okay, we turn the river the nine, so I'm probably just going to check this back. I don't really see any reason for betting it. Oh, no, he leads. Okay, fun decision. Um, hmm. I'm not confident. <laughs> I'm going to fold. Not happy about it. Yeah, interesting but... spot. So pre-flop here villain limps and we're a bit distracted here because i was asking you about the connection and things like that um off off video but i think when there's a limp small blind from a 31 v pip and it's probably a recreational player unless you know this to be a reg that plays a limp game i don't think you did no just then random. right so then my default in this spot is always to raise like any hand with even remote decent prospects like in theory we would want to be a bit polarized here and jack nine off is probably a very good example of a hand that we'd want to check theoretically but i think in mm. practice we're very rarely being limp three bet like the three bet in position node is good for us where we three bet an opener the raising the small blind limper node is just a very naturally high ev spot in the game tree 
where they're going to call a lot and then fold the flop. They're going to call a lot and play transparently or they're going to fold pre and we kind of just like mop up a lot of EV with almost any hand in these spots. So I just make that your default play just to raise 4x and, and be done with it pre. Um, This hand got really weird. Yeah, so my first thought is that when they call the flop over bet, um, it's probably most turn spots are likely going to be underfolded, I think, after that. The king is a bit different, though. The king is definitely like a scare card to a lot of pocket pair. 7x, ace high, you might get some folds on this card. I don't mind the, the turn barrel too much at all with the equity, but I would want to be more equity driven. I would want at least a gutter, I think, to do that after the flop over bet got called. And then the river, yeah, we face a half pot lead here. What were your thoughts on the river? Because you, you sort of, you were unsure... You did settle on fold. Was there anything there that you didn't articulate that you'd like to say now about like why you came to that decision? Uh <laughs> I yeah, I don't know. Um I thought that generally like over bet. I mean, we did have the gut shot on the turn, um, to the 10 for a little straight. But yeah, when he leads for half, I mean, it's one of those lines where either it's always value or it's always bluff. Like I very I struggle to believe that it would be, you know, bluffed at a perfect frequency mm. um, yep. for that kind of node. Yep. And when I think about he's calling an over bet and then he's calling a turn bet of B75, I struggle mm. to find the hands that didn't at least find, like, I guess five, six is, yeah, is a straight. I struggle mm -hmm. to find the hands that don't have at least some showdown. Like any open-ended mm -hmm. now just has, um, obviously, a pair, which I'd assume would be checking, like, if you had 10, nine. Um, and then it kind of comes down to, okay, well, what are his bluffs in this range? I couldn't really think of any on the spot. That's why I kind of stuttered and was unsure. Yeah. I think it would be close in theory, probably call or fold. Uh, but I just think it's probably slightly under bluffed, I would assume. I mean, he could, like, he would have to really be merging here, like ace jack, maybe, ace 10. Right, yeah. So so I think the times we win here, it comes from merges mostly, and it comes from higher up merges than that, that had a reason to stick around until this point. So I think the times we win... It's because villain has like ace seven or pocket fives and is just playing in some kind of like erratic fish way. But we already do know that this is a, a looser looking fish from just the line that's been taken so far. The V pip is some sort of clue. Um that said, I can get on board with fold here. It's very much post filtering, meaning like villain has filtered multiple times. The river has then removed, as you say, the natural combos of air that would be like jack 10 maybe or 6-5 or something like that or 10-6 they're all gone the 9 has hit a pair yeah I can see folding on this river but I do think the I, th I think I think folding's fine but I think the times we win it's just because villain has like fives that has like lost its mind and there'll be some amount of that but I think you're right that the combination of just too much filtering and the board running out to complete everything is just too much of a double whammy for us to want to call but if we do win it'll be against fours or something probably mm. cool Easy. Okay, so we missed the start of this hand there because we paused, but basically we have opened the hijack, been called by Big Blind, and we overbet the flop on Ace King 7. Up to you to decide turn queue. We're just going to be checking. <laughs> just checking. Uh, I mean, look, without the heart, it's probably a decent continue. Uh, yeah, nothing to do here, but unfortunately, we're just going to lose the pot here. We could probably bluff raise some of the time um but i'm not too confident in that line um the way it's been filtered so i'm just gonna fold okay so do you want me to go through the thought process for the yeah well let's let's it, well yeah you can give people a quick um synopsis of what's going on in flop here yeah. all right cool so i opened up in the hijack uh to two big blinds and we get a call from the button uh, King seven ace, very, very good board for our range. So I'm generally going to just stick to big bets over bets. Mainly I prefer, um, on this kind of texture. Uh, so I just over bet. I think it's pretty standard to do it with like a lot of gut shots here and like good ace X, um, even start doing it with some like small pocket pairs, flush draws. Like there's a lot of stuff that you get to fold, which is good because it's denying equity. And obviously we only have queen high, um, and just puts a lot of his range into a tough spot and gets a lot of folds. Yeah, I think it's also important to say that he doesn't have top two or top set or second set on this specific texture. And that's why Ace King Rag specifically is one of these like bigger nut advantage, just to be really precise here with our lingo spots. And that's why overbet is is a decent thing here. So villain calls, 
the turn is an ace what do you think theory is going to do here from a construction standpoint like how's it going to build its strat and then do you have any thoughts exploitatively in this spot I think it's probably just going to stick to like big bet again and really push that. Like we don't really want to be like merging and trying to get like value with our king eggs. Like I think we just want to really be solidifying our like value and getting lots of lots of money with that. Uh, like let's say if we had a set of kings here and they have ace eggs, we wanted to be piling in money. We don't want to be dinking around with like a B33 or anything like mm -hmm. that and get like a small pot. Like we want to play a big pot and if they fold, it's whatever. They just didn't have the hand to be able to call it. Um, but when they do call it, generally we are just going to call her and get a whole bunch of money rather than just winning like a 100 big blind pop. We're going to win a 200 big blind pop. Um, with the Queen Jack, it's nice actually not having the heart, I think, because um, obviously we unblock his flush draws that could float. Um, so I don't think it would hate betting because obviously we still do have equity, but the ace uh, pairing at the top is kind of bad because obviously it's less combos of aces, uh, ace king that we can have and a7. Um, so yeah, I opted for a check this time, but if you rolled low or you just felt aggressive and you thought they were going to be a weak player, I think doing a big bet would be more than okay. Whether that's a B75 or an over bet, it doesn't really matter too much. Mm. Yeah. So so yeah, I think I think there is a place for a B75 in your strategy and there's also a place for an over bet. The over bet range is going to be boats. Um, I don't know if Ace King like over bets here, whether it says a uh, blocker, blah blah blah, size down. I would think King X folds to most sizes on turn anyway, so I don't think Ace King is like a negative blocker that's really relevant. So I could see Ace King, maybe Ace Queen, pocket sevens, Ace seven, etc. Going for an over bet here. I could see Ace Queen, Ace Jack, like your better Ace X going for a big bet here. Maybe a King has to call it some frequency. Um, and so do weaker aces. And I think that the natural leak I would see in this spot from a student is that they're not aggressive enough in this spot against regs specifically. So I think against fish, like we do just want to play pretty straightforward here. Like we are going to face an over continue. Most of the time, if we over bet, they're unlikely to fold an ace. So we should probably build that around value. But against a reg or someone that could be a reg, I think it makes some sense to make sure that we do find some bluffs on this node because we're not going to be perceived to be bluffing a lot here. And if we do over bet this turn, and jam the river. I think there's quite a bit of fold equity against Ace X here in a regs game because if we project ourselves into villain shoes here and we say, how would you feel, Hugh, if you called a turn over bet and villain two X pot shoved the river for the rest? You're probably feeling sick with a Ace Eight or whatever, and you're probably folding a lot of your Ace Eight, Ace Nine, Ace Ten, Ace Jack combos at that point, right? Hundred percent. It definitely would be very indifferent if not probably linked towards the fold. Yeah, you have to find a very like competent player to be able to right. find that node and actually actively uh, continue the line and not you know have that second thought that's like oh no stop I don't want to lose money. Yeah, because it is just losing to call that down against an unknown. It might be winning against a really aggro player or a really competent player, as you say, but it's probably losing against an unknown. So one thing that I think you can work on here is being a bit hungrier. Well, first off, you were a bit disgusted on the turn, and I think your initial being revolted reaction kind of overrode your thought process in the turn, which is normal here. This happens to most poker players. But it's about feeling that disgust and then saying, wait a minute, is this true and is this useful? And I think the answer is that the disgust is not true because there is still decent fold equity in this spot. And it's also not useful because it's kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the visual rep representation of the opponent having trips. I think that's generally what happens here on this turn. And then we can kind of like feel that, but not really act on it and then override it and rewire. I think that's a good way to go. And then the other thing to say here is just that we can be a bit hungrier for making people fold further up into their range. This is another thing that I was talking to Ben Abadbeat about recently when we did a sweat session. I was very hungry to make people fold the bottom of their range. I was attacking capped ranges a lot. And he kind of said, well, if you are using overbet turn in the spot like this, for example, then Jam River we're actually getting hungry now against Asex. We're actually not just asking people to fold a king or whatever, but we're actually asking them to fold ace, ace eight and ace nine and ace 10 and ace jack. And why wouldn't they when that hands a bluff catcher? Now against a whale, against a station, we need to be super careful. Someone said on YouTube earlier, oh, this line doesn't work against stations. It'll get you killed when I ran a bluff. And I was like, what a redundant and absolutely useless thing to say. Oh, your bluff isn't good against the station. Wow, thank you for the amazing coaching, my guy. All right, let's jump back in if you're happy with that feedback. Yeah.
because I'm interested to see where the hand goes. Not really loving it. I don't think there's much we can do here. So we completed here? Limit the pot or was it yes. men raised? So it was min raised from Minraised. the hijack and the button called. I think here is pretty close between call or fold. I called just for the content. Um, yep. I don't think I'd ever play a three bet here, especially with this kind of hand. I think it wants to be a little bit more polarized and less mergy into two people. Well, um, but yeah, I, I think no, uh, you go. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say like, I think I would never fold. I think just being involved with 10 9 of those potters is clearly winning, right? So fold isn't on my radar. I do think three bets viable as well. And the reason I think it's viable is if you think about, don't think so much in terms of like polar, like this being mergy, because this is 10 high, right? Like while it does have the ability to flop quite nicely and stuff like that, you're also small blind against two in position players. And that's going to mean that you do need a lot of playability and like, good stuff going on in order to squeeze like you can't squeeze king three suited here right like it's just not okay it's not it's not a good enough no. hand to do it so you will be somewhat linear with your squeezing range but more to the point if you make people fold when you have 10 high when you have 10 nine you make them fold like ace jack off you make them fold ace 10 off you make them fold ace nine suited you make them fold queen nine suited you actually make them fold the hands that dominate you and then you're rather live against the hands that call you like eights or ace king or something like that right so it's it sucks to get four bet sure but i would see this as like viable to three bet or viable to call for those reasons i wouldn't think so much in terms of being like really polar in that spot yeah. Um, I think for what it's worth, mm. I would probably be more inclined to three bet the six fives and the seven, you know, seven sixes suited, all that five four suited, um, just because it's kind of out of the way of the others. Um, like ten nine is kind of one of those hands where it kind of blocks more of those middle cards, I guess. More to say, like we don't have the low stuff, which completely unblocks, and they can start having the ace tens, the ace nine suited stuff like that. Um, while you know the six fives and seven sixes really do that well. And I think from like a board coverage perspective, a lot of the hands that I would be three betting are a lot of those like suited broadways, queen jack suited, king jack suited, jack 10 suited even. Um, I think 10 nine suited is just a little bit too like in the way, I would guess. Um, and that's what I mean more so by uh, it's kind of middling more so. Um, yeah. So I, I don't hate the three bet. I would personally prefer doing it with the lower cards, like ideally six five, that's my favorite. Um, mm. And then you know the five four six seven and that way if we do get four bet there is still some incentive to be able to call and just play a pot if we still need to well if we had ten nine um i guess you could still call if they four bet ten nine suited um assuming i think i think whether you call or bet. not though like you're going to be really break even anyway like in these spots with these hands i'm not really worried about whether the hand swings to like just being a profitable call against the four bet or just being a losing call like if it's losing we should fold it if it's mm. calling and winning a tiny bit we should call it i don't think there's enough of an ev swing there where that influences my decision that much i'm just kind of going off of like you know big blind versus cutoff or something you can three bet a lot of 10 nine suited and you fold out a lot of hands that dominate you and are good and you survive well in a three bet pot and i wouldn't overcomplicate here i think we're getting into like some quite nitty gritty factors that are quite complicated and i would i would rather not like compare 10 9 to 6 5 so much as i would just say would equilibrium mind three betting my hand <laughs> and if it wouldn't then i'm only going to not three bet it if i can find a factor that's outside of equilibrium that makes me not want to three bet it like an exploitative factor and i don't really have one of those so i'd rather just say if anything i think i get under four bet when i squeeze which actually makes me quite like the three bet branch here but i think call's okay as well right let's move on to them. flop where Just we check and we face a stab goes. by button. button. What would theory do here? Like, what would be your raises, do you think, in a three-way spot here? How would that change compared to heads up? Um, oh, gosh, that is a good question. Um, what would my raises be here? So B50 and two people, I generally will assume that's more of like a B75. Um, I don't think it would be playing a lot of raises multi-way. Um, I would probably still flat sevens here a lot of the time. I mm -hmm. honestly don't think I would play a raise just because uh, I guess it's the buttons doing the, it's not the car. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't look, I think raising is okay. And then obviously 
I, I guess just a lot of the like bluff raises would be from like ace five, ace three suited. Mm -hmm. um, any combo, I don't really think it matters too much if it's diamond spade or one of the ones that aren't on the board. I think there's all incentives for either. Uh, and then like, I guess fives, sixes, and it's kind of one of those merge bets, you know, a shout out to the uh, cash injection, <laughs> bluff raising those, but that's more in three bet pods, I guess that in works. Yeah. I think, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I would really play any raises here i think you could argue obviously like a sevens if you had like eights here or nines you could for a bit of protection but i think it's probably just easier multi-way at least to just have at least what from what i found it's much better to have a super strong hand multi-way that you like slow play and then obviously like on devastating cards you can get away from on a smaller pot but there's no reason to build the pot so big when there's still two more cards to come and it is multi-way and the other guy is still uncapped to a degree. Like he has just opened, this guy's been the one that's better. If I raise, he's still uncapped. He still has sevens, he still has twos, he still has fours, mm -hmm. um, at least at some frequency. Uh, aces, kings, if I'm playing a seven like that. Um, so I don't think there's really incentive multi-way to be raising. If it was a heads up, you could argue a little bit more towards those a seven to some degree, eights, nines, um, mergey yep. kind of like fours, pocket four, uh, yep. pocket five, sorry, pocket sixes, and then just start raising like sevens and fours and twos. Obviously. Yeah, that's a good answer. Like I think multi way, that's right. Like we drop a lot of the the mergey stuff because the button is just going to be way more polar when they stab half pot into two people than if they just see bet in a heads up pot. And there is the other uncapped or ostensibly uncapped range behind you as well. Uh, that doesn't i wouldn't like leap to the conclusion from that that we don't have a raising range i think if we do have all of the combos of fours and deuces and sevens here which i think we do i think we have like nine combos of sets on this node we're not really three betting those we're not really folding those for men i think we are incentivized to build a polarized raising range it's just far more polar than the merged one now if we're doing that we probably would have gutters and the best backdoor backdoor overcard combos in there and 10 nine of spades i would guess is gonna be good enough for that job at some frequency and then the question is like do i want to do that in practice and i think the answer is it's not obvious to me that you don't want to do that in practice because i think when you start raising here again we can get a bit hungry here and we can say well button doesn't cold call fours and deuces right they might have sevens but they probably don't have a ton of sets here and how does button feel if they get check raised in a three-way pot here by the small blind and then we like bomb the turn for an overbet and i think it's a decent fold equity spot so again i think you're being a bit quick maybe just to dismiss bluffing and going after like further up parts of people's ranges in some of these situations and we can just maybe like put our radar onto that a bit more i'm not saying that like this is an amazing spot to raise flop but i don't think it's a snap fold i think it should be like on the radar that this could be in it yeah. a hand we could do we're it definitely like, skimmed over my hand at least i mean skimmed right. over my head All right, so Queen A offsuit, gonna raise that one blind versus blind. Uh, I think on this flop, we can go for small bet or check. So I'm gonna roll and I rolled low. So I'm just gonna do a small bet this time. I don't see any incentive doing more than like a B33. Uh, with my range, probably most, yeah. Okay, this is gonna be interesting, I guess. Um, so we get raised, B50. Let me think. We want to play raises, definitely don't. Definitely not going to fold top pair here when we have the gut shot. Going to have a five on the turn. There's still flush draws available that which we unblock. Still have that gut shot. So we're going to check this one over and he should be playing like an over bet here. Uh, I would assume. Yeah, cool. All right. So slightly more than a B125, B150. And I think this is where we just fold the hand since we don't have like a draw to the nut nut. If we had like... Not flush draw would be a lot more incentivized to call. Yeah, well played. I don't think there's any yeah. reason to continue that part of range on turn. Like, we have so many two pair there. We have some straight slow plays, some set slow plays. Sometimes we have like the pair plus the open ender. Like, if we were defending Queen 8 there, having already filtered by bet calling flop, I think we'd be like over defending to the over bet. And if anything, my rule is like, let's call this offsuit straight theorem. When offsuit straights are possible, you're fucked so you know <laughs> fold. it's just yeah. too hard to over bluff when offsuit straights are in your value range because they are like literally everywhere right yeah it's makes it a little bit more difficult <laughs> but i guess it means you overfold and i guess the b150 as well is probably another reason to overfold 
Yeah, I'd lean over bluffed. Me. I mean, sorry, I'd, I'd lean under bluffed if I had to like say what pool was doing there. But I think your hands are theory fault. Okay, let's talk about King Seven. Uh, yes, yeah, pretty much just checking most of my range. Um, out of position most of the boards, uh, other than very specific boards. Gonna go for another check here, just because the king's good. But like, you gotta have some, you know, little bit of traps. Gotta protect the range a bit. I would bet it probably some of the time, and I would bet probably B seventy five. I think now we just have a clear value bet. I'm gonna go bit greedy and go for a b150 okay okay uh no action yeah so the premise of that is just making sure we check out of position uh on a lot of boards especially i see at least lower stakes players and especially live players they have this kind of thought process of i'm the pre-flop aggressor therefore i need to continue like i need a 100 c bet just to uh i don't know i actually don't know their reason they just think that because they bet pre-flop they have to continue the betting on the turn and they've received so many folds and all that when in reality it's not the best range for us. Like, obviously we have a lot of like big cards, but we also have just a lot of like middling kind of things, which we're not too happy about putting money in with. And obviously there's still two more streets to come. They could just effectively, if they know that we're betting hundred percent of our range, float any two cards, which is the preemptive thought that, Hey, we're going to check a lot of our range on turn and therefore they can just bluff any two cards and we have to fold so much and we've lost additional money. Um, on that King turn, uh, where there is now the flush draw, obviously we block the back door, which is, you know, neither here nor there um i would probably be going for like a b75 or a check uh probably checking the majority of my range obviously still uh and i'm gonna probably chuck a lot more of those kind of average king x's so ace king i'd be a lot more incentivized to bet and you know hope that they have a king and get a bit of money that way but when we have like a middling king they could still have like king nine suited here for some reason or like king jack off they didn't three better or fold or whatever we don't really know what he is he's a not full stack so i'm assuming a weaker player and they're generally going to have that kind of mergy calling range. So we're still not like too happy about piling money in here. And if we bet and then check the river, they can just absolutely take us to pound town. So just double checking for protection, obviously just doing a check call. By that river though, we filtered out enough. Uh, they have a lot of pocket pairs they can call with. They might, I don't know, hear a call with an ace high. So just getting greedy and hungry, as Pete would say, going for that B150. It's nearly lunchtime here. So definitely follow me <laughs> hungry. Yeah, I think on turn... What you're the way you're playing there makes a lot of sense in theory like just going for like a big bet or check on this particular card because most of your pairs like jacks tens queens are not desperate to, to block or anything like that i don't think you have a range that's like screaming out to block you have a bit of sevens and eights that doesn't mind it but yeah i don't think building block in theory is that necessary here with the delayed c bet line you can just go for big bets and checks on this card However, in practice, you might come up with an argument like, well, it's a cold calling 21 v pip passive looking guy, so it could just be higher EV to go block block here rather than check on turn. Um, that's one way that I might actually just say, okay, I've got a default plan for theory, but I might just like adapt it in game. And I think if there's one like sort of general bit of advice I could give you is that it's great that you have these default toolkits and you have these like, you know, macro approaches to spots. But feel free to just then say, however, in a vacuum here, I'm just going to take this line with this hand and be a bit more sort of willing to do that against a, a guy with only 75 big blinds or whatever. Like, don't feel like handcuffed that you can't do that or anything. But yeah, yeah. it's not clear. I think check's still very reasonable here. It's not like it's a big thing. I would probably be 75 on those kind of middling boards. Uh, I think with A6, it's okay too. I just rolled high this time, so I'm just going to go check it um jack on the turn obviously is a little bit better for our range i still don't think i think now there's even more incentive to not be betting because i think we just want to be playing big bets or even mainly over bets and obviously this does not fit in that hand class so we are just going to be checking it's a little too middle of the road and when he bets small i mean obviously we just have to call i don't think there's really any incentive to be raising here and we have a pretty good like bluff catcher they just get yep. a lot of two cards like nice nine five off suit yeah the, the block on the river now <laughs> there we go. The block on the river after the check check line, like in Grady, the data for this is like absolutely ridiculous how overbluffed it is. When you remember that villain has this bluff tolerance of twenty percent of their range, can be a bluff. The data is something like it's a bluff half the time or something like that, and that feels meh. Some you win some, you lose some, but like you're getting four to one. You know, like that's amazing. It's so overbluffed. Just pump. Absolutely. Super, super profitable spot. Well played by you as well. Yeah. 
All right, so we've raised under the gun sevens and we got three bet by the cutoff. It was a slightly smaller three bet, so I'm more incentivized to be uh, calling this raise. I would say it's probably a mix in theory just because we don't want to be bloating our range too much. Uh, on the full flush board, we've hit a set. I think it's okay to go against a small size for a small raise, which I will be doing this time. Um, yeah, cool. It cleans up a lot of equity. I mean, that would have been a nice turn. But if he has like a overcard with a diamond, he's going to be calling a lot of that. He can't just be folding right now. We want to get the pot a little bit bigger. We don't want to go into those nodes where it is check, check on the turn. And then we play a small pot where we clearly have the best hand and give him obviously equity to draw for free. So I don't mind hating. Um, I don't hate, sorry going for the raise straight away. Uh, I do think checking is, com I mean, calling is completely fine as well. If it was a little bit bigger of a sizing, there'd be a bit more incentive to just be calling there, but it's neither here nor there. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, raising is probably best against general population because it's just going to be under bluffed, right? If you call probably by general pop, so just take the line that gets the value rather than the line that sort of slow plays and protects your range or whatever. 100%. So under the gun open is a little bit bigger than the default I'm used to, but we are obviously going to be raising up ace queen suited here on the button. Stand 7.5, pretty happy with it. We are slightly deeper than 100 big blinds, so it is something to pay attention to. If you four bets, we are going to be pure calling, which he does. He goes for a slightly more than what I would assume would be standard. I would generally be leading towards more of a 20, but 22, neither here nor there. It's two extra big blinds. We are a little bit deeper, and obviously we are going to be pure calling our combo here. So we have a 9-4-4 four, four flop. It is rainbow. We do have the heart going for us. I'm going to be expecting, yep, a lot of B50s, which we do see. So our hand is uh, pretty much a pure call, obviously. He could still just have a lot of just random crap um, that we can get to fold. And obviously, we did that backdoor effective nut kind of advantage. Um, the four of hearts, very interesting, because now any pair for him becomes a full house, and my flush outs are now pretty much dead. So if he bets, I am still going to be calling, but I'm not happy about it. Am I actually going to be still calling is the actual question. I think I can't ever fold. We are a little strong. Obviously, he can hit an ace and chop against his ace king. Queen is still a good out. He might have ace king, and then we leapfrog ahead of that. And we do have flush outs. All right, six of hearts. Very in uh, Here we go. We got the hand. Um, If he jams, I think... Oh, God, we're in such an indifferent spot. This is horrendous. This is horrendous. I'm not happy about it. I think that's just, I think it is so 50-50. Russian, what is it, Slovenian flag? That's going to be slightly more aggressive on average. Uh, we have the full minute time bank. We are going into the time bank for this. We are slightly above a start stack. I think initial reaction is, is going to be an under bluff line. Like to be following through like this, he needs to be following through with like ace jacks, king queens, um, Ace queen as well at like full frequency. Um, Ace king as well. He needs to be following through with, which I don't know if he does with a heart. I think this is like really losing call, but I also think it is very good. I'm going to roll for this one and I rolled a really high number, which is a fold, but I'm not happy about it. Okay. I'm not happy about it. Okay. Interesting. Wow. What an absolute absolute like roller coaster of a hand i mean okay so pre-flop calling seems good but it won't be very winning obviously we're near bottom of range so it's going to be like pretty neutral ev i think but maybe slightly positive flop is going to be i actually think very close against half pot and i think this surprises a lot of people but in a four bet pot in such an early configuration where there just aren't as many of the suited broadways and other four bets going on here i think ace queen of hearts is going to be i want to say it's going to be indifferent against half pot like it's literally going to be super close to a fold and so if you did fold the flop there although that looks like too tight you have to remember that almost all it of your broadways pull. it's a tight pull it's a tight um spot and almost all your suited broadways have like three quarters of them have a back door right it's just the clubs that don't you don't have a lot of like offset mm. stuff here ace king is probably just a way higher EV call than Ace Queen in this spot, regardless of backdoors, just because you are just beating more villains' range. It's much, much higher equity. So, yeah, I wonder how close flop is to a fold. I don't think calls bad, but I, I think it's getting pretty damn close, closer than people think. Um, yeah. On turn, 
I guess, like we have the ability to improve to a check back, right? So we have, we're not drawing to any implied here on turn. It's very important to note that. We have the ability to improve to a hand that can check back and win. What's best to have, like Ace Queen of Hearts or Tens or something? And this is where it gets really murky because when we have Tens, we're more vulnerable to villains' outs when villains bluffing, right? So when villain has like two overcards, they're just doing way better against us. Like they have King Queen King Jack, they're doing way better against Tens than they are against Ace Queen of Hearts. So in a way, I'd rather have Ace Queen of Hearts. The downside is that when we brick the river we don't actually beat Ace-Queen and Ace-King like we do with Tens. So this is sort of double-edged, right? And I think turn is actually closer than it looks as well for that reason. I think it's a call, though, for sure, against that sizing. I can't see it being a fold. Then on River, we hit the flush. Bill and Jams. We have a Bluff Catcher. What do we want to have card-wise here, right? I want to get into combos a little bit because this is a, a small range spot. So combos are going to be really important. What are villains' bluffs here? What kinds of cards and what kinds of suits are villains' bluffs? So from my perspective, uh, going back to the flop, I think it's like 944. It's pretty much just a range bet. And I the main size I would expect to see as well would be a B50 with this uh, formation, this uh, texture on board. Mm -hmm. You could always see the B25, but like, is just known fact effectively that you can just four bet and b25 every single board and there's like negligible ev loss so sure. i wouldn't you know hate seeing that but i'm pretty sure it's just a range bet from his perspective um so taking that into account obviously is a lot of like ace jack suited king jack suited king 10 suited like those kind of uh suited broadways as bluffs yeah. which also do have the back doors as well uh and then when it gets to the turn so i think look calling i think I understand the thought process of um, Ace Queen is a very, very uh, indifferent here. I think it's winning as a call, at least the backdoor ones. I think you could argue Ace Queen of Clubs is indifferent. I would still be calling it some of the time. I think Ace Queen of Clubs is a player. pure fold against half pot and GTO in this spot. Yeah. I'm pretty confident. Yeah. I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Ace Queen of Clubs is a pure fold against half pot in this configuration. Okay. The only reason I would assume it would be a call some of the time is like I've said, the aforementioned is pretty much a range bet. And if it's a range bet, he's just printing if we are overfolding. I, think I don't, it's I don't think he I is. Think with this poll. I, well, I don't no? think we're overfolding if we fold ace queen of clubs. Because okay. if you think about your range here, you have a few like king jack, king queen suited, maybe some ace jack suited, but even that's getting close pre. And then you've got ace queen suited. You don't have offsuit cards here apart from ace king, right? Ace king is like the only yeah. offsuit cards you have in this configuration. Maybe ace queen once in a blue moon. Yeah, but even that I think is just bad at this rig structure mm. and pool. Um, and in theory is not good. So I think if you fold ace queen of clubs, you're definitely not overfolding just by folding that hand. Um, you have so many pocket pairs here. You have so many like ace queen with the back door and ace king. Um, and you're allowed to fold a decent amount on this particular board against the c-bet against the half pot c-bet so i don't think that there's any any worries there about overfolding if you fold ace queen of clubs look it up have a look guys let us know in the comments you know how close are we who's closer to the truth um but yeah that would be my understanding is that because it's a four bet pot in a really early configuration we just need to react a bit more to that than if it was like cut off button or blind v blind or or something like that okay turn mm. anything you want to say there turn. do you want to move to the river um i guess they all kind of go in flow like uh what's his turn looking like i think it's pretty much just a b25 or a check or like a small bet and a check i don't really think there's any big bets he really needs to play mm -hmm. obviously his cards that are crushing us are crushing us and his cards mm -hmm. that are behind are behind we have a lot of stuff that's pretty indifferent especially to that smaller size and where we are going to be having to overfold um and if we like let's say they have a good hand they b75 we're just going to like easily be able to fold our like sevens and all of that without having to you know think too much well yeah with the b25 we are going to have to call and then be put into a really difficult spot on the river so agreed i think it's pretty much um i think it's a little too good to call i mean to fold yep. uh and i know this is going to sound so counterintuitive because i did fold it on the river but like we do have the flush that could still be good um <laughs> I yeah i folded on the flush well, well no the but flush yeah. is this is important though this is a really really important point the flush is an out against villains give ups right so like if villain has ace king ace queen these are hands that if we didn't have two hearts like if we had ace queen of spades now we'd probably fold the turn because 
we can outdraw ace king and ace queen very easily and we can't check back and win against those hands without further risk very easily but with ace queen of hearts we can so when we call it four to one on the turn it's not that we're saying the flush outs are great against villains river betting range they're not we still have a bluff catcher though we'll get onto the properties of that bluff catcher in just a second but that's not why we're calling turn we're getting four to one that's why we're calling turn and we have some outs that are check back outs on the river right we're checking them back and winning some percentage of the time and that's not worthless so it's not actually a contradiction to say i'm going to call the turn because of these outs and then fold the river when i get there it sounds like one it's actually not when you look at the pot odds and what's really happening there okay yeah right and then um with his like bluffing kind of area it's like he needs to be finding a lot of follow-throughs with stuff like ace jack uh spades and clubs and like king queens and jack uh king jacks all of that as well which might be a point where it might not be happening at uh, enough of a frequency to justify it. But I still think for the aforementioned reasons, it is still a winning call. Yeah, I think turns a winning call. It doesn't have to be very yeah. good and we don't need to be very happy about it. Okay, so on the river, the value combos then are aces, kings, and queens. Is that fair? Uh, I would say like any overpair. I think it's one of those spots where I still do need to be calling. Um, and I do need to like call, well, I guess some people will still be calling like sevens, eights and stuff like that if they do jam on the river. Therefore, mm. I think you can push it all the way down to like tens. I don't really think there's any nine okay. in his range. Um, so I'd say any overpair would be like for value. Okay, but tens and jacks are here hardly ever compared to kings and aces, right, from pre? Yes. Okay, so yes. when I say it's mostly aces, kings, queens, I guess what I'm saying is like jacks and tens a might not go this thin and b might not exist pre so they've had to jump through a lot of hoops to sort of be jamming the river for value so what does that mean for our blockers then our ace queen of hearts like are we going to block any bluffs are we going to unblock bluffs are we going to block a lot of value let's actually do the taboo thing here you know at risk of yeah, being burned at the stake by the anti-gto <laughs> people and actually count some combos and do some blocker work how good are these blockers how positive are they yeah, I mean, obviously, blocking an ace is good. Blocking a queen is good. It's going to cut down the combos dramatically of those overpairs, at least from the aces and queens category. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, obviously, it's good having the hearts because <laughs> their, their bluffs come from, obviously, like yep. Broadway spades and diamonds and all of that right. jazz. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I guess it comes down to a combo counting thing. I would be more happy to call it with a little bit less like obviously we were a little bit i think what like 120 big blinds um pre-flop mm. so we're a little bit more deeper which means obviously the pot ups are slightly worse for me um which shifted my uh rng sorry uh my that shifted my rng uh decision mm -hmm. which i had no rng relying on that blah 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 but um obviously skewed it a little bit more i made it a 50 50 and just rolled high yeah but um yeah look I'm not happy about it. It's one. This is yeah the beauty of poker. I love these spots where you just like are never happy. Like no matter what the decision. Like if I call and I was right, I still wouldn't be happy. If I called, I was wrong. I'm obviously yeah. not going to be happy. I fold. I'm not like there's no happiness. It's just indifference, and you got to work through that. So this is fun. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very painful spot. It's like getting put in the blender, isn't it? It's one of the classic like, don't we just love poker spots? So my final verdict on this hand is that it sucks. However. I wonder, I'm, I'm just trying to decide if any of Villain's bluffs do come from like the Ace of Hearts, Queen of Hearts here, like Ace Queen with the Queen of Hearts, Ace Queen with Ace of Hearts. And I think that they do because we would yes. want to call. So I actually do think we block bluffs here. And I think on a three flush river, Villain probably does favor the one heart hands for betting turns slightly and probably favors the one heart unmade hands for betting river as well. So it's not clear to me that the blockers are overwhelmingly positive. I do think they're still positive though because I think a lot of bluffs will just come naturally from King-Queen, King-Jack, King-10 in people's ranges here, and we unblock all of those while blocking three of the six combos of aces and three of the six combos of pocket queens. So my, I guess I'm going to say that against a good reg or unknown kind of reg that looks like they're playing solidly from in a more, more aggressive flag, I'm going to call this hand and just suck it up at four to one and be like, or three to one and just say, yeah, I'm usually going to lose, but I think I'll scrape, you know, 25% based on the blockers being more positive than negative or something. And I think this is a much better hand to call than, you know, two black jacks, actually, because yeah. with two black jacks, you literally block some very frequent bluffs and no, okay, you block kings, but you're not blocking that second 
queens through aces over pair. Whereas here we have blockers. We have a rare hand that beats bluffs and blocks, you know, the big combos of over pairs. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's one I call and kind of hate it and cry. But if this flag was different, if it's a fish or something, I think it's a really good fault. Just a quick point on the RNGing. I know you're going to this because you're just unsure. You've been unable to reach a verdict and you've gone to the RNG. This is the sort of spot where I would really try and reach a consensus without doing that first, which you did. And the RNG for me here, I would really try and not use it as a crutch or a comfort blanket, only as like an mm. absolute last resort, because this spot is probably overbluffed or underbluffed. It's just kind of hard to figure it out. But I think with this hand, yeah. the blockers matter enough that I'm just calling this combo and saying it's positive enough. And then I do trust Rex to do a decent job of tripling four bet pots with King Jack suited because it's kind of an overfolded node usually. So I do kind of trust the more aggro ones to do it. But yeah, definitely close and a crappy spot. And I don't think it's bad to. There's nothing wrong in and of itself of saying I'm going to call a turn and then fold river when I hit. That isn't the problem as far as I'm concerned. I just wonder if the blockers are just about positive enough that we take it at those pot odds. But but yeah, yeah. so that's my kind of verdict on the hand, weird I guess. Spot. Mm -hmm. Very weird. Yeah, weird spot. I yep. Okay, Hugh, so this has been really fun. We didn't get tons of interesting hands, but we got one extremely weird hand that I think is going to generate a lot of discussion. So I'll get this edited and put out. And if you guys like it, we can do Live Sweat again. I can do this with other people. I can do it with Hugh again. Let us know what you think of this format. Super important for us to know. And don't forget, get ready for the launch of Weapons of War, guys. It's very close now. Prepare for that course with cash injection and code weapons will get you 25% off the little brother course of Weapons of War. And yeah, good job today, Hugh. I think you played pretty well considering you just lost 10 buy-ins this morning. I can sense you're a bit tentative <laughs> because of that, but I think you you handled yourself pretty well in this session, even though you were a bit card dead. So yeah, good job, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. We'll get you back on soon. All right, guys. Until the next time. Bye from me. Bye from Hugh. See you later. See you.